So we'd like to start with kind of an analogy around where we're seeing companies. And if you think about Google and all the queries they do a day, you think about uh, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, you know, a lot of these companies have something in common. And fundamentally, they're all internet companies, their valuations are gigantic. Uh, the value they deliver to our industry is very big. But in common, what they really have is this concept of big data. And we all talk about big data, and we all overhype big data, and we're, we're all sort of in that space. But if you break that down, it really kind of breaks down into a few things. Uh, one is really being data-driven, or monetizing your data. Uh, the second is around social. So these are very social platforms, where they're using social to drive their message. And then the third is really open source. A lot of these companies are built on open source technology. There's a lot of talk about the Duke at the show. But I think, in general, there's a lot of open source in there. And, and what, at EMC, what we do is we're really bringing that to the enterprise. And I'll talk in detail about what I mean by that. But in general, it's about bringing these technologies, these methodologies, these uh, tools that were used to build these internet giants and create tons of value for that, and bring them to the enterprise. But I want to start with an example. And I think an easy example to use is advertising. I think we're all products of advertising. A lot of us work in advertising, etc. But it's a good example of how we got to where we are and, and how big data happened. So we really started with sort of this. Right? We would go out and we would kind of carpet bomb people and we'd end up with advertisements, maybe in the right place, maybe in the wrong place, etc. But in general, we would have something to this effect. Not very effective, but yet we would spend lots of money on that. So we spent money and we started to get more targeted, right? And we started to look at, you know, how do we better spend our money? We buy data from other folks, we start to get more targeted around that. But we were still a little bit off base and we ended up with something similar to this, right? Not, a, not an effective use of your time and money. So we switched to the A-B testing. So those of you in the web space understand A-B testing, uh, something to the effect of we test our users, we figure out where they're most interested, but the end result is typically our users weren't very excited about that and ended up leaving the building. Right, so now I think things have changed, right? Things are different now. Now it's about big data. And I think with this data, it does change things. So I'm going to go through a couple of customer examples. The first one is around uh, advertising, to stick with that thing. Uh, and this example is a credit card company. There are tons of data, they've acquired a number of companies, so they're sitting on credit card transaction detail for 10 years across millions of people. So true you know, scale and big data. And what they're looking to do is leverage that information. They're already collecting interest from all of us, but they want to start using that information to sell to their suppliers so they can turn around and sell that data, monetize that data with the big internet companies. Uh, and they started with you know, their legacy system where they're doing sort of best guess, and they've moved into this space where they can start to leverage more and more data, and get more and more accurate. And what they're delivering now is what they call mobile couponing. Is anybody familiar with mobile couponing? Yeah, this is a, a trend I think you'll see more and more of. And the, the theme here is when you walk by a McDonald's in this example, they want to send you an ad to your phone to get you into that McDonald's. So they know where you are location-wise. They know from your credit card history what you buy and where you buy. Not a lot of us use a credit card McDonald's, but nonetheless, they still do that. Uh, and they really want to get to this point where they're leveraging this data and monetizing this data. I, I think the end goal is something like the Minority Report. So those of you that saw that movie, he goes into the mall and he's bombarded by advertisements. So hopefully we never get to this point, but I think that's sort of the end goal of advertisers. And unfortunately, with the amount of data they're sitting on, they could probably deliver something like this. So that's a quick example around advertising. You know, I, I think a lot of the early stuff you think about it, but it's more than just advertising. There's also major industries getting involved here. So healthcare is a great example. Uh, this is an example of a green phone customer that is a evidence. Uh, providers. Basically, they look at claims coming in from hospitals and validate them for an insurance company to make sure that you follow the appropriate pathway and thus get paid for your claim. And what they were doing is really sort of building these pathways and, and looking at how to treat patients on a small amount of data. If they didn't have the systems or the ability to really look at all the data, and they were doing best guess. They were looking at, you know, summary data to determine, okay, if, if your condition is XYZ, here's the pathway you should follow. They came in and they, they, they leveraged, uh, in this example, the Green Pump database, and were able to sort of look at all of that data and start to look at 10 years of history. And it improved the, the level of service data. It also, they found a lot of fraud in the system. So there were folks that were doing, you know, uh, they would basically submit claims under a wrong social security number, collect money, and, and do frauds. So they were able to pay for the whole system up front based on the fraud detection they found. 
But what they're doing is really this push towards personalized medicine. And when you talk to the CTO, a very visionary guy, uh, he's, he's all in on data. And for him, it's about improving healthcare and getting to this personalized medicine. You know, we all hear about personalized medicine, and you know, I think we're getting better at it. But in general, they're, they're describing and teaching doctors how to treat folks. And the better their data is, the better the treatment will be. And the more specific it is, the more specific it will be for you and me. So they'll look at drug interactions. They'll look at environmental hazards. They'll look at all of this information on this drive towards personalized medicine. And, and this is good stuff. I mean, advertising is great, but this is about saving people, and, and they're really pushing hard on that. Uh, another example I'd like to highlight is uh, a financial firm that uh, was basically back in the day in 2008 while the credit stuff was going on. Uh, they were struggling. They were looking at risk models and they were updating their models. It took them about 30 hours to update their risk model, which meant those systems had to be online, which meant they had to do that on the weekends or potentially at the end of the month. So they were at least seven days behind, potentially 30 days behind in their risk scores, which means they were making loans that may or may not be the right type of, of transaction. So they went to a different system. They were able to do this in minutes. They could start to do risk updates every day. And they, they started doing better loans, and they were actually very successful. Um, they came out of the crisis acquiring banks. They weren't closing down like some of the, some of the larger systems out there. They were actually building on this, and they were doing that through data. Um, this team specifically started with um, using analytics to kind of predict mortgage prices or predict mortgage rates over time. Uh, they leveraged a lot of data science. They pushed everything into the database, and they used all of their data. So all of these examples have one thing in common, which is about looking at all of your data. And I think that's kind of why we're all here today. I mean, the name of the show is data for that matter. But we look at and how to monetize and how to use this information. And I think that that's key to how we're going to succeed going forward. And again, it's more than just advertising. It's about healthcare. It's about banking. It's about all of our industries and all of our lives being impacted by that. So Greenplum, if you look at Greenplum's history, we were a database vendor. Uh, we built an MPP scale-out database, so basically a, a software application that runs on lots of servers and allows you to do very fast queries. Uh, but what we found is it takes more than a database. Right? I think that arguably we have the best one, of course I believe that I work for it, but beyond that I think a lot of our customers really test to the scale of that. But it takes more than that, and I think you've seen us embrace Hadoop. So we came out uh, last year with the Hadoop distribution. Uh, we've also rolled that into something we call the Unified Analytics Platform. And this platform is about structure, it's about unstructured, and it's about people, and I'll talk about each of these. But in general, we feel that you do need a full range. There is no one solution. I think Hadoop's a great thing, but it's not the only thing. I think databases are a good thing, but they're not the only thing. When you bring this together, it becomes very powerful. And for us, it looks like this. All right, so if you start at the bottom of the stack, uh, it's all about sort of software running on your favorite cloud, commodity, x86 infrastructure. Uh, for us, we have two processing elements. We have the Duke, we have database. They're tightly fused together, so um, we do things like queries across, so you can send a query to our database, it will actually query data in Duke. Uh, you can run the Duke flows and push data into our database. Uh, you'll see a lot of innovation between these two as we move forward, things like store once, use many, federated queries, etc. So we're tightly fusing this bottom layer around database and Duke. On top of that, we have the data and query layer. And this is about where all your tools come in, things like Big, Hive, SQL, MapReduce, et cetera. And federating those and bringing those together so that the 30 plus years of SQL skills most enterprises have, they can start to leverage on new platforms, right? Rather than let's retrain the whole army, let's use what folks have learned already, federate that into all of your data sources. We're also very big on partners. Um, we don't build a complete stack and say you must use this BI tool or this reporting interface with this database. It's about openness. And we embrace everything from open source things like R to highly advanced stuff like SaaS, uh, all your BI vendors, etc. So working closely with that team, we really want to build out that infrastructure and allow you to do it. And then the top of the stack is Chorus. So Chorus is what we uh, announced many times, but actually announced again yesterday. Uh, there's a story around that for open source, so one of the things we're going to be doing is open sourcing for us. And the reason for that is really to enable scale and enable extensibility. And we'll talk a little bit about what Chorus is, but uh, that was a big announcement. I think it's ENC's first actually open source project. 
Uh, they contribute a lot into Hadoop and into other open source projects, but to have a software product created by us that we're open sourcing is a first thing for EMC. And I think it shows sort of how we're investing in this big data space. The other thing we talk a lot about is, is the people. And so, you know, most infrastructure stacks don't have people on them. Uh, but in general, we have this concept of a data science team. And I think data science is, you know, a new curriculum that's really changing the way people go after and use data. And this team is some of your, some of the folks in the room. It's the BI folks, it's the DDAs, it's the data scientists themselves. But most importantly, it's the, uh, the executives and the business users. Because they're the ones asking the question. They're the ones that need the answer. They're the ones that are delivering better service to customers, delivering better health care, avoiding financial crises, et cetera. Right, so bringing that all together is, is what we're about. But I think we're more than just infrastructure. I think one of the challenges we see in the industry and, and what everyone's really focused on is the bottom of that stack. It's all about the dupe, it's all about database, it's all about infrastructure. But it, it takes more than that to do real things, and to do big things. And for us, this is where data science comes in. And I think that starting to look at the holistic picture rather than just narrowly focusing on something like a dupe is an important piece of, of the way you go to market. And for us, we have our own data science team. We uh, do customer engagements where we bring in our data scientists. Uh, they help our customers quickly come up to speed, uh, solve a particular problem. Uh, it's very much a pairing model where we uh, pair with the customer and when we leave, they're, they're fully up in service and we start to build additional applications or find additional insights. Um, and we're also committed to this uh, curriculum. So we actually have data science training. Uh, we work with leading uh, universities, Stanford, Berkeley, MIT, et cetera, to develop curriculum for data scientists. We feel this is really the future of how uh, data will be discovered and used going forward. So we're big into that, right? And I think there's a big people equation that a lot of us as a, an industry are sort of overlooking. We talk a lot about infrastructure. We need to think more about the people. Because this is different. This is change. And you know, we talk to customers and you know, the hardest part for them is change. It's easy to buy a platform and to buy a database, etc. But getting your organization to change and think differently about the way they access data, the way they get to data, and the way they solve problems is, is fundamentally a new thing. So I want to talk a little bit about Chorus. So we did have a big announcement yesterday. And it's about making these teams more effective. So if we look at sort of the legacy analytics process, this is what most enterprise go through. So the question will come up, you know, why are sales down, these types of questions. And as a data analyst, this is what you need to do. You go out, you have to find the data. So you need to figure out where does it live? Is it in our enterprise data warehouse? Is it in a new cluster? Is it in a file on someone's laptop? You then need to get access to it. So this is typically file an IT ticket, wait a couple weeks, and then you have your data. Once you get in there, you need to learn about it. The columns may be names inappropriately, there may be letters. So learning about that usually means finding someone that built that database and really understand. Or even worse, looking for a data dictionary that's likely out of date. Once you get into that, you can move what you want into your sandbox and then do real work. So this is very time consuming. Most, most of our customers we talk to, as they look back at solving these problems, these are month projects. These are not to be an answer by the end of the week. This is, we'll come back in six months and let you know why sales are down. By then, everything's changed again, and, and frankly, it, it's, it's near worthless data. Chorus is really built to change that. Right? It's about doing agile analytics. And this Chorus application came from our experience with our customers, as well as our internal data scientists. So we did what good companies do, and we actually listened to our customers. And what they found was they needed a tool to sort of bring all of this together, a collaboration. So if you saw our launch yesterday, we talked a lot about the social aspect of this. But it's really about a development environment. So the way to think of this is maybe a development environment for analysts. Uh, it includes a social component, so it's very easy to start sharing information. It allows you to discover data, search, etc., across your enterprise. Uh, but it was really built to do iterative and agile analytics. One example of that is the collaboration piece of that. Uh, so in general, you know, what you can do is start to look at um, if you look at this interface, what you'll see is a very social interface, right? So our early customers had uh, development teams across the world. And with this interface, they can start to log in and work real time. Uh, it brings a lot of value in that it's very reusable. It's a little bit hard to see on the screen. I apologize for the screenshot, but we are doing demos in the booth if you want to take a closer look at it. Uh, but fundamentally, it's about capturing this information. 
It's about giving you access to your data. And what we found that I think was really interesting is that it increased security. Like a lot of the early folks that looked at this were really concerned about, hey, are you sort of opening up my data warehouse and all that confidential information to everyone in the enterprise? And in a way we are, but what we're doing is increasing security because you can now see what, where that data is. What happened in the legacy process is people take a copy of it, they put it under their desk on a machine or in a shadow data mark, and you never know what happens to it. Now, of course, you can see what's going on. You can actually click on a particular asset, a database or a Hadoop instance, and see what projects are running against that. Uh, we also enforce the security of the database. So, of course, it's not a new layer of security. It's about enforcing underneath. So we never give people access to data, we enforce the database access. So we've seen security increase. We've seen uh, speed of uh, development or speed of insight increasing. And fundamentally, you start to see folks working together in a very collaborative environment. So we're really excited about course. We think it's a, it's a great, great option for us. Uh, in general, uh, we've been building this for a number of years, again, based on some of our customer stuff. Uh, the other announcement, or the other important uh, aspect that we announced yesterday was around a company called Pivotal Labs. So is anybody familiar with Pivotal Labs? Because, okay. So Pivotal Labs uh, is a software uh, consulting firm. They're really an agile firm. Uh, they started in 89. Uh, they are they have an office here in New York. They have an office in San Francisco, about 150 people. And what they do is uh, very unique agile software development with the customer. So first of all, if you want to work with Pivotal, you send your developers to their facility. And the facility is uh, very collaborative. They do something called pairing, which is where you put two people in front of one computer. And then each day you work with a different developer, so you end up, all of your developers end up learning all of the code. Uh, they have very sort of fixed schedules, so that you start at 9 a.m., everybody eats breakfast at 9 a.m., you start, you pair up, you work till 5 p.m., and you're done. And what they found is they can very quickly develop applications and ship those applications. Uh, what they've also done is, is built a tool around it called Pivotal Tracker. So those of you that are agile programmers out there, I encourage you to take a look at Pivotal Tracker. It's a SaaS offering for these folks, but it allows you to write very simple stories. So if you're a product manager and you want to build a new product, you start writing stories. So think of these as requirements. And then each pair or each team chooses a story or is, picks the story at the top of the list that morning and delivers it that day. So you write a story that's a one-day pairing application. Once you check that in, it does all the builds, it does all the testing, and if you broke the build, the screen goes red. Right. The screen goes red, and at that point, everybody fixes the build. But in general, it's, it's a unique way of doing it. Pivotal, we started with Pivotal on our course application. So we first came to Pivotal to help us build course. Right? We've built a number of databases, we have a new distribution. But we've never really done customer-facing software, so to speak. Uh, so we came to Course, or we came to Pivotal, and they helped us deliver that. And it was a great experience for us. Uh, we now have acquired this company. We're going to invest in Pivotal. I think that the important piece to understand is we're not going to change Pivotal. Uh, what they've done is, is amazingly good, and we don't want to break that. Uh, we will invest in them to scale, so we expect more offices worldwide. Uh, their focus has largely been gaming, um, web, uh, so we'll continue to push in that space, but we're also going to look at building big data applications. So if you go back to that healthcare provider I talked about earlier in, in this session, you know, they're looking at delivering that data, that personalized medicine, to us, to the end users. So that final mile or that final push, they're going to need agile development, they're going to need an application on that, and, and that's fundamentally what we're looking at Pivotal, is to help build big data applications over big platforms. I talked a little bit about our partner ecosystem. So uh, again, we're not about lock-in. We, we work with a number of really innovative companies, big and small, uh, classic SaaS, you know, microstrategy, kind of your data warehousing folks of the world. Uh, we're also working with a number of the, the interesting startups that you see running around this room today. 